Good morning, everyone. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, 2018 NDS Design Examples. My name is Marcy Weber, and I'm going to be the education team moderator for today's presentation. Today's webinar is going to run one and one half hour. Today's speakers are our Director of Educational Outreach, Lori Cook, and from the Canadian Wood Council, America Lopez Molina and Young Du. Note that this course is approved by the American Institute of Architects. If you belong to that organization and wish for us to report your credits, email us with your member number after the webinar. This course is um, copyrighted. And just a quick disclaimer, note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. You've likely seen the description already, so we will not spend any time covering this, but hopefully you are here for the discussion of and live working out of design examples for the 2018 NDS. And then the learning objectives. The goal of the course is for you to gain knowledge of design values, design provisions, design requirements, and an introduction to CWC's woodwork software. And I hope that, um, you all can follow along in the PDFs that we've provided in the handout section, but please note that due to the real-time solving of the equations, um, and the slides and PDFs may not align perfectly with what is being presented. We thank you for your understanding in advance. And then this is our today's panel and our production team. Um, Lori Cook, our Director of Educational Outreach, America Lopez Molina from the Canadian Wood Council and Young Du from the Canadian Wood Council. Um, we are delighted that you are here and hope that you find something of value. Welcome everyone. So uh, as I get set up, my name is Lori Cook. I am the Director of Educational Outreach at the American Wood Council. I'm joined today by my colleagues, uh, Young Du and America Lopez Molina from the Canadian Wood Council and today we're going to be presenting some example problems. So the format for today will be I will present the problems worked out uh, in MathCAD. So what you're seeing right here on the screen now is a, a printout of the MathCAD file that I used to calculate this example. So we're going to do a series of examples today and the way that today's uh, webinar will be structured is I'll present the hand calculation uh, or MathCAD hand, I guess, uh, calculation. And then our colleagues from CWC will take over and show the same example or in the uh, Woodwork software that they have. Uh, and then we'll take questions on each example for a few minutes after that example is presented. We'll also take questions at the end. So feel free to submit your questions as we go along and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. We've got a really big crowd today. So again, thank you everyone for joining us um, and we'll, we'll do the best we can to answer as many questions as we can get to. All right, everybody. So. This first example we're going to talk about today is a nailed connection where we're going to be calculating the capacity of a, a connection where we have more than one fastener. We're going to do multiple nails. So we're going to do this in ASD or an allowable stress design. And we're going to assume that we are using 12D common nails. Uh, and you can see the length and the diameter specified there. That information for standardized fasteners in the NDS is available in NDS Appendix L. So if you are curious as to where you can find that, uh, that's, that's in there. We will use three rows of three fasteners, so a total of nine fasteners. And we're going to use a main member of a 4x10 number 2 southern pine and a side member of a 2x10 number 2 southern pine. The specific gravity on both of those is equal to 0 0.55. This example is going to be designed for dead and construction live loads. So it's going to be slightly different than, than some of the other examples we do where we just do dead plus live. Um, we'll talk about that. And 
for the moisture and temperature conditions, we're just going to assume normal conditions, so no special adjustments necessary for those. Uh, and the members are going to be loaded parallel to grain. Uh, and America is going to show an illustration of this uh, fastener, or of, I'm sorry, of this connection uh, in the, the example when she goes through it next. So just sit tight. Again, defining some of the parameters of the uh, connection, just laying it out for MathCat. The fastener diameter is 0 0.148 inches. The fastener length is 3.25 inches. The row spacing we did not define earlier. We're going to specify it here as 2 inches. And the side member dowel bearing length is simply the side member thickness in this case. So it'll be one and a half inches. The main member dowel bearing length, we need to take into account the tapered tip length on the nail. So NDS 12353 gives us the provisions for how to account for that. For a nail, we are supposed are to subtract one half of the tapered tip. And for this, uh, the NDS allows us to take the tapered tip length as two diameters. So because we're subtracting one half of the tip length and the tip length is two diameters, what that winds up looking like is we're subtracting one diameter off of the main member penetration. So our main member dowel bearing length um, winds up being the length of the fastener defined here minus the side member dowel bearing length this l sub s minus that fastener diameter because of that tapered tip uh, the next thing we need is our load duration factor for a construction load in nds table 232 we see that we can use a load duration of 1.25 and we specified that the moisture and temperature factors, C sub M and C sub T, were just normal, um, normal duration, uh, or I'm sorry, normal conditions. So the adjustment factors for those are simply set equal to one. So the next factor we'll, we need to uh, calculate or account for is the group action factor, C sub G. Uh, NDS 1136 gives us a provision for this for dowel fasteners with a diameter less than one quarter inch. C sub G is set equal to 1.0, so we don't have to do anything special for that. Our geometry factor is the next factor, and this provides a reduction of the reference lateral design values when we have less than the full end distance, edge distance, or spacing that's specified in NDS 12.5.1. For dowel type fasteners with a diameter less than one quarter inch, C sub delta is equal to 1.0. So uh, for guidance on nail spacing, we can go to the NDS commentary table uh, C 12.1.6 to give us some guidance on how to set up our connections for nails because of that uh, lack of requirement uh, in, in the, the main body. So we've got the, the tabulated solution and commentary to give us some, some suggestions. So next we go into NDS table 12N and we look to see what our reference lateral design value is, the Z value. Uh, and we see in table 12 n we get a value of 128 pounds. Checking the footnotes of the table, we do need to make sure that we meet all of the assumptions in the, in the table. Uh, one of those assumptions is that the main member penetration is equal to 10 diameters. So calculating our minimum penetration required based on our fastener diameter, we see it's 1.48 inches is our minimum requirement. We have uh, 1.6 inches and some change, so we don't have to worry about adjusting it based on the penetration. So we are good to go. We can take the Z value, we can take our adjustment factors, and we can calculate the capacity of our multiple fastener connection. 
So we have, remember, three rows of three fasteners. So there are nine total fasteners in the connection. So that's equal to our N. And we simply use the values we've calculated or looked up in the tables from the NDS uh, in this equation. So our adjusted value is the number of fasteners times that reference lateral design value, that Z value. And then our adjustment factors that we calculated or looked up as, as needed. So our adjusted ASD lateral design value for this connection is equal to 1,440 pounds. So going through all of that, that is certainly a lot of number crunching and a lot of pencil sharpening. So what we're going to do now is let America work the same problem. And I'll give you the screen here, America. Uh, she's going to work the same problem now and show the benefits of using the software to calculate it uh, instead of all of the math CAD that we just went through. Thank you so much, Lori, uh, for having us uh, today. Um, we always, you know, enjoy uh, being able to do these types of examples uh, for, for professionals. Um, so I'll just start off with um, just kind of describing a bit of what you see on the screen right now. So this is the connections program, which is part of the Woodwork software. Um, so this is the interface and you'll notice that we have a few um, images here on the right hand side of the screen, but we also have a list uh, which also describes a bit of uh, the geometries that are included on the left hand side. Um, but just before we get into that, I just want to bring your attention to this help icon, or sorry, this help button here on the toolbar. Um, so there's a lot of uh, useful information that you can find here. The first is the connections help. So you can either click on uh, this option here, or you can click on your F1 uh, key, and this will prompt you to a link where you can essentially navigate through everything there is to know about the connections program. The user guide um, is another great, uh, great tool, kind of goes through uh, all of the features that uh, are seen in the connections program. Video tutorials uh, are wonderful. I know this is probably one of our uh, popular uh, sources of uh, additional resource material, I should say, um, that's available on our Woodwork software website as well. So there's a series of videos there's also uh, hand calculations uh, tutorials as well. Um, just want to point out as well that um, you do have a direct access here to NDS. Um, that includes the supplement and the online. And one of the last things I just want to, to mention is if you click on the About Connections option, you'll notice that you'll get this window. And this window tells you a little bit about what standards are used and what standards are being followed in order to generate these design values. Um, so just to you know, bring to your attention here that connection, this connections program is following IBC 2018 as well as NDS 2018. And of course, it also includes a structural steel specification as well. Of course, all of our information is here. Um, our technical support, which can be found through our Woodwork software website um, and the link is uh, uh, posted right here underneath all of this information. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, so one of the first things is you want to identify what type of connection you are dealing with. Um, so in this case, you have the option of post and beam and lap shear. And if I just click on post and beam, you'll notice that the images uh, narrow down to which type of connections are actually classified under the post and beam. Um, so if I were to click on all geometries, you see all of the possible geometries connection, the connections program has to offer. Now, given this example, we're going to click on the lap shear. You can also collapse and expand these uh, options here on the left hand side as well. So if, for example, you didn't want to see all of, you know, the post and beam and the lap shear, you have the option to simply collapse the post and beam section. And so 
you can choose your connection either through this menu here on the left hand side alternatively uh, you can click on the image that's shown here on the right hand side so to start off we're going to click on this splat, uh, splice two member section here and then it prompts you to this option here so if you notice sorry i'll just collapse i'll just show you here you'll notice here under splice to member it'll list all of the it will list all of the uh, types of you know fasteners that you can have for this particular configuration so for a splice to member simply you know a side and a main member uh, put together you have the option of selecting nails bolts and wood screws so we're just going to go ahead and we're going to click on the nails option so now what we're looking at is we're looking at where we can you know input our main uh, member information you'll notice that there is a there is a, a tab for the side member as well so we'll get to that once we start inputting the information You'll notice on the left, on the right hand side here, this is where you have the option to specify the moisture content, the temperature. Um, in this case, uh, it does account for fire retardant, but of course, this is something that is normally left as not active, and it's something that you would have to manually input. The loads right now is grayed out because we haven't specified you know, our thickness and width, but this is something that you can normally do um, once we get to inputting the side member properties. And finally, we have all of our fastener details down here at the bottom of the screen. You'll notice at the top of the screen, you still see those images from the previous page. You also have you know, a slight description of the type of connection uh, that you have selected. So what we'll do is we're just going to start off by inputting our main properties here. So we're going to keep the material as lumber soft but we will change the species to Southern Pine. And we're going to change the grade to number two. And you have the option of choosing the thickness and the width by clicking on the option from the drop down menu. So in this case, for our main member, we'll click four. But you also have the option to manually input these dimensions with your keyboard. So for the width, I'm just going to enter a value of 10. I did this here with my keyboard, uh, so without having to go through the drop down uh, menu. So once we've entered our main member, we can go and enter our side member properties. So once again, we're going to keep the material species and grade as the same. So we're just going to change this to Southern Pine. We're going to select a number two grade, but in this case, our thickness is going to be two inches, but we'll still have the same uh, width of 10 inches. So before I enter the load information, I'm just going to come down here and I'm gonna specify the fastener information. And I'll explain why in just a moment. Um, so what we're going to do is the nail type where we have a common wire nail. No. Yep. So maybe what we'll do is we're going to do this here real quick. I'm just going to jump back to the te uh, to the loads here. So for our duration uh, in the problem statement, we were told it was dead in construction uh, loads. So that gives us you know a duration of seven days. And just for you know example sake, I'm going to add a force of a thousand pounds. As soon as I add this load, you'll notice that a diagram generates here on the left hand side. Um, so now I should be able to, okay, so now I'm able to come into the nail length and we were told that the nail length was three and one quarter inch. So that's equivalent to 12D. So the number of rows will specify this as three and the nails per row. All right, so that gives us a total of the nine nails that was uh, presented in the problem statement. As for the spacing within rows, we're just gonna enter two inches and two inches for the spacing between rows. So one thing I wanted to show you, and this goes back to just moments ago when I was saying, you know, I wanted to leave the loads for last. Um, you notice that we've specified the number of rows and the nails per row, but this diagram itself has not generated to reflect the 
um, fastener property. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to change, or in this case, I was missing a zero for a thousand pounds. I'm just going to add that extra zero in the loads, um, in the loads box over here. And you'll notice that as soon as you update the load information, whether it be the force or the duration, the diagram on the left-hand side updates as well. So here, what we see is, you know, we see our dimensions, we see the spacing within and between rows over here. We see that our force of a thousand pounds is being, um, is acting on this side here, but we also see the, uh, the member dimensions as well. So once you've entered the main and the side member properties, you have your fastener properties, as well as, you know, all of these other factors um, that come into play when, you know, we calculate the yielding resistance, we can click on this run design button. And you'll notice that it'll just kind of, you know, run its design and within seconds, really, you'll notice that these icons up here um, are now clickable, so you can click them. So if we click on the diagram one, um, we essentially see kind of like a bigger scale diagram of um, exactly our uh, fastener, our connection system here. Um, but really where we want to see the information is the results page. Alternatively, you know, you can click the buttons, but everything that you see here um, as an icon, you'll also see it here on the, um, on the toolbar. So if, for example, for the connection, you want to jump back to the details, you can click on it through here. Alternatively, you can just jump through uh, these icons um, below. Um, so one of the one of the things that you know I normally uh, like to tell our you know our audience is that sometimes by default the font, whether it be in the results or in the diagram, can be a little small, a little hard on the eyes. So one of the great things that you know we've included in the program um, is the fact that you can change the font size and the type of the diagram and the results. So for this particular case, I'm just going to click on the results font. This is where you have the option to change, you know, the type of font and the style, but more importantly, the size. So if I just bring this to 20, I'm going to click on OK. And, you know, now it's a bit easier on the eye. So you're not squinting at your screen trying to read out, you know, all of this information. Um, so the results page is separated um, kind of, you know, between, you know, a few different sections. So let's start from the beginning. You'll notice that the first line is going to describe to you what type of uh, connection system you have. So in our case, it was a one wooded side member. It was nailed, and this is considered a spliced joint. So what we see under the connection data is really a summary of the main and the side member. So you'll notice that here we've selected our material, um, our species, and our grade. Um, it also includes, you know, the uh, width and thickness of uh, our members. In this case, under temperature, we didn't do anything. We left it as default. So, but the important thing is, you know, these are some things that would be summarized in here. Similarly, the fire, um, the fire factor as well would have been included down here um, had we included it. Um, as for our loads, we did specify a load of a thousand pounds uh, acting on the main member, as well as, you know, seven days duration. So this really comes into play when we're specifying the load duration factor. Um, so the next, you know, section in the results page is our connector design. So this summarizes all of our fastener uh, inputs. So if I just go back to the details real quick here, you'll notice that the nail type, the nail length, as well as all of our spacing and, you know, how many bolts we have, um, that's all summarized here in our uh, connector design. So you'll notice, you know, the type of nail that we chose, the diameter, the length. Um, it summarizes here how many nails. And of course, this is dependent on how many rows we have and how many nails we have per row. So if we continue down, in this particular example, um, there's not too many, there aren't too many, you know, items here uh, for calculating uh, the resistance. Um, and one of the things that, you know, is really key here is that it does state um, where we're, uh, what equations are being used, from what publication, from what standard, 
um, these equations are coming from. So that, of course, is NDS 2018. And all we're saying here is that the resultant load R is equal uh, to 1,000 pounds. And what we're doing here is it calculates the lateral capacity. So that's that Z, that Z factor that uh, Lori had mentioned earlier uh, going through uh, the example for calculating the uh, lateral resist, uh, the yielding resistance, sorry. So in this case, you'll notice that we do match, um, I believe in the example Lori had mentioned, it was 140, 1,440 pounds. Here we just have, you know, an extra, an additional two pounds. And of course, it always summarizes the, the design ratio. Now, the last thing that we have down here is the additional data. So this will summarize all the adjustment factors that were used in the example. So of course we have the load duration, which due to the construction loads that gave us a factor of 1.25. We have our wet service conditions and our temperature, uh, which we decided to leave as is dry conditions and uh, the default temperature. So that gives us a value of one for those factors. We also have the group action and our um, geometry factor here, which we left as one. In this case, uh, our CD and CA, uh, ST were not applicable, so that's why we see this dashed line. And just underneath, we have the yield limit values. So these equations are the ones that are summarized in table 12.3.1a, of course, of NDS 2018. So this just summarizes the values that we get by using those equations. All right, so that's just kind of a general overview of the connections program and how you would start with the geometry. You would enter your you know, main, your side member, your fastener uh, properties, and with a click of a button, it generates the results. It uses those equations that are in the standard and boom, you have your results. <laughs> As Lori mentioned, no need to sharpen your pencil. Um, and it's really quick. It's something that, you know, is great for running quick designs. And of course, once you're satisfied, once the results are okay, you've gone through them, you can always click on accept. <clears throat> And of course, you know, you would save the file and it's something that you can always print. Um, and another great uh, feature that the Connections program has is that these diagrams, they're very similar to CAD. And in fact, uh, for some type of connections, you have the option to export these as a CAD file, um, which can be viewed in AutoCAD, of course. So what I'm going to do here uh, Lori, do I have time to go through the uh, additional bolt example? I think we're going to go ahead and, and move to the next example because we are uh, trying to fit a couple of extras in. Okay. Um, but what we can do uh, is we'll make the, the uh, calculations available to folks and if okay. they're interested. Um, but I do want, we had, a, we had a few questions come in just real quick um, okay. before we get into the next example. The first one is, um, can this program be switched into metric? Yes, that's a great question. Yeah. So if I go back to the details, um, let me see here. There's an option, I believe. I know we have this in Canada. Um, it's a, it's enough to tell us it exists. I think we can. Yes. Uh, I know. I know. Out. It seems like it seems like for the U.S. I don't have that option. Let me just yeah. open. I know because I I've done this uh, using the Canadian version as well. Mm -hmm. I know in Canada we do have the option to jump between metric and imperial. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about that is instead of ha instead of opening and creating a new file uh, in the metric or in imperial section, you would simply enter all of your values. You have the setting. Um, you have the setting in here where you would have the units. So in the okay. unit 
have the option just to toggle between them. No need to re-enter yeah. any of the information. You would just um, click on that and you would see the conversion right away in uh, the input, in the uh, details page, in the details interface, and in the results. All right, cool. Uh, other question on uh, connection geometry. Do we input thicknesses as nominal or actual dimensions? Yes, so you can input these as the nominal. Okay, great. Uh, and then one last question on this. If we are uh, analyzing in a different year, if we have like an older version of the code that might be in effect in our state that we're designing in, does Woodworks have the ability to uh, kind of go back uh, a version of the code or, or um, is there a way to accommodate an older design code? That's a that's a great question. Um, Young, perhaps you can, you know, correct me if I'm mistaken. Um, Connections does not have the option of using uh, older codes and standards. Um, I know that in Sizer, and maybe Young will touch base on this um, when he goes through his examples, is that in Sizer, there is an option, um, at least for Canada, um, there's an option to use older codes and standards um, in the event you know that you were that you had a design that was using a previous uh, version of, of the standard. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. for connections um, in the U.S., we don't we don't have that yet. Okay. So uh, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Uh, this is Yang. If I can jump yeah. in real quick here. Please do. Uh, so yeah. If you look at the latest version of the software, it does always conform to the latest. Uh, version of the codes and standard, but if you purchase our software, um, what we'll do is that we'll give you a free copy of the old version. Let's say if you are looking at NDS 2015 or earlier, then we will give that uh, uh, older version uh, to you so you can check uh, your connection design using an old code and standard. Excellent. That's great to know. Thank you, Young. All right, so our second example includes a double shear bolt example. Um, so as mentioned in the previous example, you have the ability to select uh, which type of fastener configuration you would like from the menu on the left-hand side. Alternatively, you can select on the image, which is shown on the right-hand side. So for this particular example, we're going to just um, we're just going to click on our post and beam option just to uh, bring that menu up. Uh, you can click on the lapped shear and we're going to do a wood to wood connection. And for this particular example, we're going to select this image here on the right hand side. So this here as shown in this description here, it's a bolted splice connection with two side plates. Now in this particular case, we were not given the option of which type of fasteners to use and that is because for this particular configuration um, connections will only design it for bolts so that being said we can go ahead and fill in our properties uh, for the main member here so we'll keep the material as lumber soft but we will change the species to spf and we're going to select a number one number two grade so for our thickness, we will enter a value of two inches and we'll select a width of 10 inches. So just a uh, reminder here that you do have the option to enter the, uh, these dimensions manually by using your keyboard. Alternatively, you can click on the drop down menu. So once we have the main, um, the main member properties, we'll click on the side tab up here on the right hand side. We're going to specify the same species and grade, so that will be SPF and number one slash number two. And we're just to be consistent throughout, we're going to specify the same dimensions. So two inch thick and 10 inch width. Moving on to our options here on the right hand side, we're just going to keep our moisture content as dry. We're going to keep the default temperature we're not going to include a fire treatment factor, but we are going to change our durations in order to account for our construction uh, and dead load. So we're going to change this to seven days. 
And for the time being, I'm just going to put a load of one. So what this will do is this will generate the diagram here on the right hand side. And it will also um, enable some of the options down here when we specify the, the fastener uh, properties as well. So we'll come back and we'll we'll um, we'll update the load once we're done with our fastener properties. So what we're going to do is we're going to specify a bolt diameter of one and a half inch, and we're going to have two bolts per plate and two bolts per row. And we're just going to specify the spacing between and the spacing within rows as two. So you'll notice that you can select uh, options from the drop down, but in this particular case, you can manually input as well, very similar to the dimensions of the main and the slide member. So I'm just going to set that as two inches for both. And as soon as I update my load, you'll notice that the diagram on the left-hand side will update as well. So I'm just going to add three zeros. So that will give us a force of a thousand pounds acting on the main member. So you'll notice now that we see our four bolts here spaced at the two inches as specified down below. So as simple as that, now we have our diagram, we have our main, we have our side member properties, we have all of our uh, modification factors set and our fastener properties. So we can simply click on the run design uh, button here. It's going to do its calculation. And then you'll notice that the results and the results uh, icon here at the top um, will, it will become uh, enabled. So we're going to click on the results here and very similar to example one, the results page, it's going to show uh, very similar information, if very similar information. So we start off with the connection data. So this here just summarizes what kind of material was used for the main and the side member. And you'll see in both cases, it was lumber soft SPF number one, number two, and it's going to specify, um, sorry, it's going to list uh, and show the uh, dimensions that we decided to, to proceed with. It also summarizes the temperature. So in this case, we decided to leave it as, as is. So there's no big change uh, compared to example one. We have a summary of our load. So along the main member, we have a force of a thousand pounds. And of course we have changed our modification factor um, so that it reflects the seven day duration. So if we keep scrolling down, we'll find a summary of our fasteners. So this is just going to summarize the, the fastener properties that we entered in our details page. So if I just jump back to the details page real quick, you'll notice that the diameter, um, the rows per plate, the bolts per row and the spacing, all of this information um, that was tabulated, you'll now find it here in the results in one page, sorry, in a few lines. But now here comes, you know, the information um, that, we that we're really interested in and, that, and those are the results. So all of this is, Connections uses the equations uh, directly from NDS 2018. And you'll notice that in this case, we do check for those local stresses um, since we're dealing with a bolt connection. So what's happening here is we're checking the tension capacity, the row tear out, group tear out for the main member, but also for the side member. So you'll notice that we do get those values expressed in pounds uh, here. And alongside them, we have a ratio, which essentially compares um, the analysis versus the design. And lastly, the yielding resistance. So this is something that we saw in example one in our nail example, the lateral capacity um, in this example. So Z prime, which gives us a value of 20, just you know, 20 to 100 pounds with a ratio of 0.45. So all of these, so essentially the, the first two, so the main and the side uh, member, these are the local stresses that follow the equations that are in appendix E. Now at the bottom here, 
it just summarizes the additional data. So by additional data, we're really looking at, you know, what kind of adjustment factors were used in our calculation. And you'll notice that we'll find all of our um, modification factors here. So we have the load duration, our wet service, our temperature, the group factor, our geometry. And just below it, we'll also find the yield limit values. So you'll notice that in this particular case, um, we have these two here that are missing. That's because these two equations here didn't apply to a double shear, uh, double shear uh, connection. All right, so once we have all of our results, we can click on accept and then we can save the project file. And just a, you know, a brief reminder here that the diagram uh, icon uh, you'll be able to see a full-scale uh, diagram, again, showing our bulk connections as well as all of our spacing as per our details that we inputted here in the details page. All right, so it's my turn again. This time we're going to talk about compression members. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about an uh, interior bearing stud. Uh, and for this example, we're going to do the exact same problem twice. Uh, this first time we run it, we're going to run it with ASD or allowable stress design. And the next time, the second time we run it, we're gonna run it using LRFD or load resistance factor design. And the, I'll, I'll, we're gonna Tarantino this, I'll give you the ending first. We're gonna show that it gets the same capacity regardless of which uh, design method you use. So uh, knowing what the end result is going to be, we can jump into this and uh, we have a nominal two by eight SPF, spruce pine fir number two, uh, interior bearing stud. So it's 91 and a half inches long. And we're gonna assume it's sheathed on both sides, which is important for, for bracing, for our bracing calculations. Um, and, you know, this is typical interior bearing stud. So, you know, gypsum sheathing probably on both sides, we didn't specify, but um, we need to calculate C sub P, which is the column stability factor. And unfortunately, MathCAD in their new version doesn't have subscripts in text boxes. Uh, so that, that is a C sub P, not C P. Um, but you'll, so I think you all can probably bear with me on that. Uh, the top and bottom plates are going to be the same grade and species as the stud itself. And we're going to assume that the stud is placed at 16 inches on center. And we need to determine axial loads based on buckling and bearing limit states. So. This is an illustration of our stud. It's uh, loaded at the top and the bottom, and we're assuming a, a, a pin pin connection. So it's not a very exciting illustration. But uh, jumping into our reference design values that we will use to calculate our adjusted design values, our F sub C is our compressive, compressive stress, uh, compression parallel to grain. In NDS table 4A, we find that that value is equal to 1150 PSI. The E min value uh, is also defined in table 4A, that's 510,000 PSI. And then F sub C perp or F sub C perpendicular is the compression perpendicular to grain, uh, which is 425 PSI. For our load, uh, duration, we're assuming it's a normal load duration, dead plus live. So C sub D is equal to 1.0. Our normal indoor use uh, applies again. So C sub M and C sub T are just equal to 1.0. Our size factor is C sub F, that's 1.05. And we just get that out of the NDS supplement table 4A. And uh, our C sub I is our incising factor. This is not an incised member. And C sub capital T has to do with um, if it's a, a truss member, which it is not. So those are all equal to one. We can calculate our adjusted E min prime uh, and our adjusted F sub C perp prime based on the 
uh, the adjustment factors we've defined here. However, to calculate the F sub C prime or the adjusted compression parallel to grain value, we're going to need to do a little calculation. We need to calculate that column stability factor. So moving forward, we're just defining the member properties. So the length is 91 and a half inches and then breadth and depth are one and a half inches by 7.25 inches. And for those of you that might not have the nominal dimensions, or I'm sorry, the actual dimensions of the nominal uh, member committed to memory, those member dimensions are in the NDS supplement table 1B for solid soil members. So calculating our column stability factor, we start with F sub C star, and that's the adjusted bending design value with all the adjustment factors except that column stability factor, that's C sub P that we're gonna calculate. So F sub C star is uh, calculated um, using the low duration, moisture content, temperature, size factor, and sizing factor, and we calculate uh, 1208 PSI. The next thing we need to check are the effective lengths of the members uh, in compression. So we said that the member was braced with sheathing on both sides. So if we look at NDS A113 uh, regarding lateral support of the weak axis due to the gypsum sheathing or due to sheathing, um, we see that, that that unbraced length in that weak axis goes to zero because it is continuously supported. So in this case, the strong axis buckling will control and the unbraced length is simply equal to the member length. So we see L sub E1, which is our strong axis uh, effective length, uh, is equal to L. And then we also have to do uh, a slenderness ratio check, which um, is the L over L over D or L over B for the, the weak axis. Uh, and we see that our L O L E one over D for strong axis is less than 50. And uh, for those of you that, that might do some steel design, you know, you might be um, familiar with that KL over R equals 200 slenderness ratio check. Uh, it's a very similar concept. So it precludes the use of columns that are susceptible to buckling with with setting that L to be uh, less than 50. Um, calculating this F sub C E, this critical buckling design value from, for compression members. Uh, this is a plug and chug from NDS 3715. This, this uh, formula is defined therein. And then calculating our column stability factor, again, NDS equation 3.7-1. Uh, so this is a bit of a, a bit of a bear to calculate. So it is nice that we have NAFCAD to do that for us. We've calculated this F sub C star and F sub C E value previously. This C value is a constant. It's just equal to 0 0.8 and that's defined in the NDS as well. And we calculated column stability factor C sub P equal to 0 0.881. Uh, remembering that F sub C star is that adjusted design value with all of the other design values except our column stability factor, we can shorten up our calculation and multiply F sub C star by the column stability factor, and that gives us F sub, prime, F sub C prime. Uh, and this is the adjusted compression parallel to grain design value. So we use this in calculating our axial loads for buckling uh, and based on our Euler buckling. Uh, so we calculate our, our buckling loads as well as our bearing perpendicular to grain and parallel to grain. Uh, and that's this bearing perpendicular to grain uh, would be that, that crushing at the seal plate that, that you might see. Uh, so we see that uh, our controlling value actually is that perpendicular to grain bearing. Uh, the NDS in, in uh, section 3.10 does address this, um, this bearing area, uh, or I'm sorry, this, this bearing failure. 
So where we have a bearing controlled fit load on interior studs, like we have in this example, we can use this bearing area factor to increase the, the capacity uh, for an inch and a half bearing length um, measured parallel to grain in our case, that, that bearing area factor C sub B is equal to 1.25. So increasing our, our perpendicular to grain bearing load, we see our controlling value is 5,777 pounds. And this is not in the code. This is uh, just engineering judgment. Uh, I assumed a dead to live ratio of four to one. And using that, I calculated approximate dead and live load quantities that we can compare to the, the LRFD values. So just keep these uh, in mind. The dead load is equal to 1155 pounds and the live load is 4,622 pounds. So now let's go ahead and run the same problem, like I said, but using LRFD. So it's the same stud in the same wall, same top and bottom plates. The load combination for this uh, example is going to be 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. So that's out, just out of our ASC7 load combinations. All right. Scrolling into here. Again, our NDS table, supplement table 4A is where we get these reference design values. So none of that is different. Uh, we will use a few different factors that we see in NDS table 431 and in appendix N related to LRFD. So we have the lambda factor, which is equal to 0 0.8. And we have our format conversion factors, which are our K factors. These are defined in table 431, uh, just based on the type of the, the, the um, sorry, the, based on which stress uh, they're, they're associated with. So this K sub F C is the load, or I'm sorry, the format conversion factor for the compression parallel to grain. This K sub C perp is our format conversion factor for compression perpendicular to grain. And then we have this one over here, K sub F E min for the E min value. Uh, accordingly, we also have our fee factors, which are also defined in NDS table 431 for our compression at 0 0.9, for our modulus of elasticity at 0 0.85. And then calculating our adjusted design capacities, we see we have our E min prime, F sub C perp prime, our column stability factor check. I won't go through the entire thing again. It is the exact same process. There is a minuscule difference. We see of about 2% here in this C sub P, and that's just the expression of using C sub D versus using lambda and phi uh, in the case of F factors. So uh, minor difference in the, in the C sub P factor related to that. But if we continue to scroll and we see our of our allowable loads. We see again that it is controlled by that perpendicular to grain bearing. Uh, so we can increase the, the allowable value using that barrier, bearing area factor. <laughs> and we find our P bearing uh, value is 8,683 pounds. Assuming the same four to one live to dead ratio and our 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live load combination. We get a dead load capacity of 1143 and a live of 4570. Uh, in the previous example, we had 1155 and 4622. So that's, you know, about a 1% difference or so. Um, so it's a, a very minimal difference. 
so now I'm going to give the screen to Young, and he's going to show us how to do that type of calculation using the software. Sounds good, Nori. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say it's my pleasure to be part of this webinar and show you the Woolwork software. My colleague America has already demonstrated the connections program. Today, I will talk about the sizer program. Specifically, I'll talk about the column mode and use that to build the same example that Lori did, but using the software. So first, just a quick recap of the wall start example we are looking at. So we are designing a internal start within a wall that has a start height of 91.5 inches or 7.625 feet. The species is SPF, the grade is number two. We have a cross section of two by eight. The start spacing is 16 inches center. Sheathing is applied on both sides of the start narrow face to provide lateral stability. Finally, if we take the node capacity from Norris example and convert it into a uniform node, the wall is able to carry a dead node of 866 PLF and a live load of 3466 PLF. So with that out of the way, I'm going to jump into the sizer software and build the example in column mode. So to enter into column mode, I'll click on this column like icon. So first I'll uh, go through the design using ASD. To do that, I'll go to settings and then here you can see uh, you can toggle between ASD and the LRFD for the design. So I will select ASD first and uh, click on OK. So here you can see the entire inputs required to build a start design. From the example, we have the uh, start height of 7.625 feet. For the member type, you can choose between column, wall stud, and wall panel. And for this example, we'll obviously select wall stud. In terms of the materials, you can see uh, several different options. In our case, it's a number stud with a species of SPF grade number two and a width of two inches by eight inches. The start spacing is 16 inches on center. So here you can see um, the inputs for deflection limits. This is only relevant when a wall stud is under a lateral load. Let's say a out of plane wind node being applied to the wall stud. In our example, the wall stud is only under compression, so there will be no lateral displacement, therefore, this deflection limits is not gonna play a role in our design. So next, I'm going to move on to the modification factor. As Nori mentioned, uh, the temperature factor CT is equal to 1.0. This corresponds to a temperature equal to or less than 100 degrees. The service condition factor in the example is 1.0. This corresponds to a dry service condition. Below that, you can see two checkboxes. Uh, both are related to repetitive member. So this refers to the repetitive factor that are in NDS. Um, however, the repetitive factor is only applicable to the bending properties of structural members. Again, in our case, we are looking at a start wall design that is under compression. So those check boxes will have no effect on the design. In addition, in the example, we're not considering incising in the number or fire retardant treatment. 
So moving on to the next portion, this is the part where uh, you can specify the lateral support conditions. As you can see, the lateral support details can be specified in either the lateral phase or in the wide phase. As a default for WordStat, you can see for the lateral phase, continuous lateral support is being provided in the lateral phase. This is also reflected in the diagram where right now we are looking into the depth of the member and you can see sheathing has been attached to the narrow face of the star that is running into the screen. So that's the lateral face. For the wide face though, um, lateral support is only provided at the ends of the support. So that's the default for wall start. Um, you will happen to see that the default for wall start in the software matches the assumptions in the example. So in this case, we don't need to make any changes to the lateral support input. So moving on, um, you can see here, uh, there is the ability to change the boundary conditions at the base or at the top. So you can select between paint or fixed as, and as we do that, uh, the KE factor also updates. In our example, we have a pink paint collection. So I'm going to select that. And this corresponds to a KE factor equal to 1.0. So at this point, we have uh, um, input the parameters related to the start. So the uh, geometry, the material, the modification factors, uh, the lateral support and end conditions. Last in the input is the support for bearing design. So in our case, this refers to the bottom wall plate. Here I'm gonna go ahead and select bottom plate. Um, and then you can go ahead and uh, select the material species and grade. In our example, because we're using the same uh, material in the bottom plate as the wall start, I'll just simply click on same as wall start to save some time. Uh, in addition, in our example, we are looking at an internal start. So that corresponds to a bearing area factor greater than 1.0. So here, um, I'm not going to check this bearing at support end box, because if I do that, um, the, the factor will be 1.0 as opposed to 1.25. So uh, next I'll switch to the nodes view. This is where uh, we can add the dead and knife load into the software. So the first node, I will give it a name, dead node. Uh, obviously, the type of the node will be dead, and it will carry a Excel node using a UDL distribution. And from the example, the uniform node is 866 PLF. Next, I will add the second node from the example which is a live load having a distribute having sorry having a type of live and uh, as a axial UDL distribution. In this case, the node magnitude is 3466 PLF. Click it. So you can see once those nodes are added, there is a visual representation um, in the diagram as well. One thing to note is that um, the software automatically applies a 16% eccentricity to the, comp to the compression node. But in our case, uh, the design example considers both nodes as concentric. So for that reason, I'll uncheck this box. So you see the eccentricity for both the dead and knife load becomes zero. Uh, moving on into the self-weight box, 
So here you can see two options. One is self-weight automatically included in node analysis. And the second option is self-weight must be manually input as node. So basically what the first option does is that the software is generating a automatic self-weight based on the self-weight of the member. So in our case, it's a wall stat. In our example, the dead node inputted above has already included the self-weight of the wall stat. So we don't want to uh, have the software generate a second repetitive uh, dead node for the wall stat. So for that reason, I'm going to change the self-weight um, to be to be turned off so it doesn't generate a second self-weight for the wall stat. Uh, note that there are other inputs um, and adjustment factors in the node uh, section, but those are not directly related to our example. For that reason, I'm going to skip ahead and click on run design. So once you do that, you can see the software generates a design result page for us. Um, for today, I'm going to scroll down and just highlight the most important part of the design result, which is the analysis versus honorable stress table, or what I call the design ratio table. So here you can see the software checks uh, the design of the wall stud for axle compression. So that's the CFC prime that Lori mentioned. It also checks the axle um, bearing design and for the uh, wall bottom plate, it checks the um, support bearing for compression perpendicular to green. So basically all three checks that Lori did in the hand calculation are also being done um, in the example. So again, it uh, the, the table shows you the analysis value, the design value, and eventually the design ratio. So here you can see um, in our case, the support bearing has a design ratio of 1.0. This is because um, in the node input, we entered uh, the maximum node capacity from the hand calculation. So uh, one other thing I want to quickly point out is that uh, for those of you who are structural engineers, uh, you want to know how the software calculates its design values. So the additional data table provides more details in terms of the, the strength values being used, the adjustment factors. Um, I always pay attention to the factors that are not equal to 1.0 when I run the design. In this case, it's the column stability factor, which is 0 0.88. I believe in the head calculation, it's uh, 0 0.881. So a very, basically a very close result. Uh, the CF factor, the size factor reported by the software is 1.05. This is the same as the head calculation. So um, that's it for the allowable stress design. For um, limit state design, um, we can basically keep the existing input and uh, change the design procedure from ASD to LRFD. Once I do that and click run, you will see um, a very similar um, design result being generated. And in this case, uh, due to the minor differences uh, between the ASD capacity and LRFD capacity that Nori um, had worked out, you will see uh, in this case, uh, we are slightly over in the support bearing design. Uh, just to show you the additional data table, uh, because now we are running the LRFD design, you will see that some of the factors that are specific to LRFD are showing up, such as the uh, lambda factor, the phi factor, and the format conversion factor. So, uh, Nori, I think that's it uh, from my side uh, for the first example. 
I will pass it back to you uh, for the other example. Thank you, Young. That was great. All right. We had a few questions um, that I just want to jump address on that before we jump into the last example. Uh, uh, Young, some someone wanted to know: um, Are there uh, provisions for structural composite lumber products such as LVL or PSL or something like that? Um, so does Woodworks the program have any provisions for for non solid sawn products? Uh, so, so I, I think the answer I should say is yes and no. Um, so okay. we do not have uh, um, LL, LVL. I should say I'm sorry. Uh, structural composite number products from a specific manufacturer, but we do have a database editor where you can add um, any SL product based on manufacturer's literature, and if you add it. Um, to the database editor, the program is going to um, run the SL design based on the NDS um, structural composite number uh, chapter. I believe that's uh, chapter seven or six or seven, uh, and then yes. it will um, give you the design result. So, so basically, um, you will need to um, provide the software with the uh, design properties from manufacturer and then the software will take over and run the design for you. Excellent. All right. Well, I will jump into our last example here. Um, I'm going to probably have to push through it a little bit quickly and I'm not sure if we'll have time to uh, run the software example on this one, um, but we'll, we'll get everything uh, in that we can. So this is a CLT bearing wall with combined bending and axial loads. So this is, I wanna just make it very clear up front. This is not an in-plane shear design. This is not a shear wall. This is a, a bearing wall that would have a wind load that would be applied in out of plane. So a, along the face of the, of the wall uh, to, to apply a, a out of plane load. Um, so it's a CLT wall, unbraced height of 10 feet or 120 inches. We're assuming the live load is 21,000 PLF, dead load is 7,000 PLF, and we're trying to determine an appropriate wall section. Uh, the wind load I want to talk about for just a second because this is an ASD problem. If we are familiar with the ASC7 load combinations for ASD in section 2.4 of ASC716, we note that all of the load combinations for wind that we're going to use use 0.6W. And rather than carry an extra 0.6 throughout the entire problem, I've set the wind load equal to 40 PSF as our design. Uh, which you'll see in our in our defined loads here. So again, that's that's just because this is an ASD design example. The way that that ASC seven treats wind loads in ASD, uh, we have that zero point six, and rather than carry that again, we're just doing it up front and using that forty psf. Our uh, column loads: we have a dead load and a live load, like we said, in pounds per foot. Uh, uh, width. So we're going to design this wall as a one foot wide strip. So everything is going to be done on a per foot basis. Our CLT design properties are going to come out of ANSI APA PRG 320. That is the production standard for CLT uh, that is referenced in the NDS. So if you're curious where these values are coming from, they are in PRG 320. Uh, if you have questions about where to get that, you can email us, uh, info at awc.org. We're happy to direct you to the necessary resources. But these are all just tabulated values, so I don't want to get into where they're coming from other than we just plucked them from a table. We've got a reference compression stress of F sub C naught, 
uh, a reference bending moment. This is this F sub B S effective. And then we have a reference bending stiffness, this EI effective, and a reference shear stiffness, so the GA effective. So the first thing we're going to do is calculate the wall compression capacity. So this is the axial load due to dead plus live load. Um, and we're, we're using a, a three-ply, let me scroll back up a moment. We're using a three-ply CLT panel. It's made from laminations that are one and three eighths inch thick uh, and they're three and a half inches wide so it's a nominal two by four ish with a little shaved off so calculating our area parallel to grain for a three ply panel we understand that the laminations for clt products are orthogonal to each other or uh, the, to the adjacent laminations so our Parallel to grain area is only our outside two plies, our outside two laminations. So we use the two times that 1.375 inches uh, to calculate our area parallel to grain per foot. Our P sub C is calculated just as that reference compression stress F sub C O times the area parallel to grain. Our apparent wall buckling capacity is the next thing to check. So um, we, we need to first uh, calculate the apparent bending stiffness uh, using NDS equation 10.4-1. Uh, and, and what this, this apparent bending stiffness that we're calculating here, this EI apparent uh, that we see here, this is calculated because the design values for CLT, when uh, these design values are not adjusted to include shear deformation, we need to determine the total shear component of the total CLT deflection. So we use this EI apparent, this apparent bending stiffness to calculate our, our C sub P value, our adjusted allowable column capacity. We further adjust this EI apparent value, EI app, uh, according to NDS Appendix D and Appendix H to determine EI app NIN. And if you want further information on that, NDS Commentary 10.4.1 talks about why we're doing this. Uh, for this design value, or I'm sorry, this design example, we're going to assume our load or our adjustment factors are equal to 1.0 unless otherwise noted. So we're not gonna worry about moisture or temperature or, or things like that. This is more just um, powering through, you know, how do we design a CLT wall? So our load duration factor for this, this part of the example is equal to 1.0 since we're only designing for dead and live loads and we've got normal indoor temperature and moisture conditions. So, we already calculated a column stability factor in our previous example, so I don't want to go over this too, too much, but I do want to point out, if you look at these equations, they're going to look a little different than the way they're presented in the, the stud example we just did. And the reason is that these, these are the alternative equations that are presented in the NDS commentary in C 3.7.1.5. Um, you can use the, the NDS provisions in the main body of the standard. They work just fine. For some examples, I just personally like these a little bit better uh, because the, they can be used for both rectangular and non-rectangular cross-sections. And some of you might be asking, you know, why isn't the load duration equal to 1.6? Well, this is, again, only a dead plus live load that's the axial loads. So we'll get into checking our, our wind loads and our combined loads uh, with that higher load duration as we go further. But for those of you, I see the questions popping up. This is just um, dead plus live load, so our load duration is just equal to one. So calculating our C sub P, our column stability factor, we get a value of 0 0.52, and we can calculate our adjusted P sub C prime value, which is our adjusted axial capacity. Um, a, good a good idea whenever we're doing a design, 
the design examples, just checking our ratio of demand to capacity to make sure that we're not designing something that is woefully inefficient, right? Just because it, it works, uh, you know, we, we don't want to necessarily have too much extra capacity either. So this one, we're at 0 0.91 for the, the axial demand. Uh, so that's a good number. So just just uh, an efficiency check. Nothing that's actually in the code, more of just a best practices engineering check. This is an automated check that MathCAD I set up to do uh, just to check the ax if the axial capacity is sufficient. It says it is, so we can move forward. So the next thing we're going to check is the bending capacity. So this is just the wind load that's applied to the face of the wall. So we're checking just the, the bending moment. And this is, again, that 0 0.6 wind load uh, is, is the, the controlling load for this. Calculating our bending moment, just based on WL squared over 8, and our load duration factor for wind is equal to 1.6. We can calculate our beam stability factor. Uh, it, it's equal to 1.0 based on the provisions of NDS 3331. And again, remember, we're doing this on a per foot basis, so that's why that B value is equal to 12 inches. All right, we've calculated all of our necessary adjustment factors. We can calculate our adjusted bending moment capacity for our uh, moment demand. And we do see that we have plenty of capacity. This one, uh, you know, we're, we're so close to uh, 0.9 on, on our axial um, calculation. So it's, it's all right if we see low numbers in our ratios for our other calculation checks. And again, just an automated uh, bending check for this MathCAD uh, ca bending capacity. And then the last check we'll do is a combined bending and axial interaction check. So this is where we're checking the dead and the live and the wind load all occurring at once. Uh, going into ASCE 716 2.4, we are going to use our controlling load combination. We're going to assume it's zero point or sorry dead plus 0 0.75 live plus 0 0.75 times our wind load so because our load duration factor changed we do need to recalculate our axial bearing factors for that increased load duration that load duration factor of 1.6 uh, so we're simply repeating the process we did before to calculate that that C sub P, that column stability factor. And then remember, we had a, lo a load combination of dead plus 0 0.75 live plus 0 0.75 wind. So when we do our combined interaction check per NDS 3.8, uh, we see the dead plus 0 0.75 live uh, in, in the numerator on the axial term, and we also see that 0 0.75 times the moment in the combined, in the, in the bending term. And our combined interaction check shows that we have a, a value of 0 0.66 for our interaction value. Uh, that's less than one, so our combined bending and axial check is okay. All right, so let's now look at the CLT design example that Laurie just did, but uh, designed using the Woodwork software. Um, first, let's uh, quickly review the design examples in this uh, particular CLT wall. Um, here we have a panel height that is 10 feet. The grid of the panel is E1. The panel depth is 4 at 1 8 inches which is a three-ply panel. The dead node being applied is 7,000 PLF. The live load is 21,000 PLF. We also have a wind node that is 66.7 PLF applied laterally to the wall. Now I will switch back to the 
sulfur. And for this example, I will again use the column mode. So, um, as I mentioned earlier in this example, the height of the wall is 10 feet. For the type of material, we will select wall panel. Uh, material is CLT. In terms of the species, we're looking at a E1 grade, which is made of SPF number. So I'll select SPF and then the grade is E1. For the panel depth, in the example, we have a depth of four and one eighth inches, and this corresponds to a three layer panel. Here you also see an option related to panel orientation where it can be selected as either longitudinal or transverse. So if I select longitudinal, you can see from the diagram that the fiber in the two outer layers of the panel runs in parallel to the longitudinal X of the member. So this is what longitudinal refers to. Now, if I switch this to transverse, you will see that the fiber orientation in the two outer layers are now running transverse to the direction of the member. So in our example, um, the two outer layers are running parallel to the member to make use of its higher compression capacity. So for that reason, we'll select the panel orientation as longitudinal. Next, you will see the deflection limits. In this example, the deflection limits does come into play because there is a lateral node being applied to the panel. Here you can see the deflection limits can be uh, changed to your uh, desired uh, limits based on the uh, specification. Uh, but for, simpl for simplicity, I'm going to use the default deflection limit, which is L over 180. Below that is the modification factors. In the example, the CT temperature factor is 1.0 and that corresponds to a temperature equal to or less than 100 degree. Next is the lateral support condition for the CLT wall. In our case, the lateral support is only provided at the ends of the members. So we just use the default, um, the default value for lateral support condition. In terms of the end conditions, uh, the software allows users to have either pinned or fixed boundary condition. In the example, it's pinned condition at both base and the bottom. Below that, the software has a optional feature where you can perform fire design. So if you uh, want to perform fire design, simply select the number of sides being exposed and then the duration for fire resistance. And after that, the type of protection, either one layer of gypsum board or two layer of gypsum board. Uh, in this example, we are not considering fire design. So I'm going to deselect it. So the software does not show the fire design result. Beneath that is the supported design for bearing. Uh, again, in the example, we're not considering the bearing design of the supporting member. So I will select the type as none so that the software does not output uh, support bearing design for us in the design result. So at this point, we have completed the input for the CLT wall panel, the material, the geometry, the deflection limits, modification factors, and the lateral and end conditions. Next, I'm going to move to node view. This is where the nodes can be added. So in our example, we have uh, three nodes. The first one 
is a dead node that has a uh, value of 7000 PLF. The next one is a live load have, having a magnitude of 21,000 PLF. And the third node is a wind node. So I'll select wind as the, as the node type. And this wind node is a uniform line node applied laterally. So I'll select this and then the node magnitude is 66.7. One thing to note is that the dead at knife load in the example does not include eccentricity. So for that reason, I'm going to turn off the automatic eccentricity applied in the software so that the dead at knife node becomes concentric. One last thing before we uh, run the design is that uh, the software, as you can see, the software does include the uh, long-term def deflection as per NDS352, uh, which requires a creep factor uh, being applied to the dead node portion of the long-term deflection. And this is uh, uh, being considered by Sizer. So now we have all the inputs ready and uh, I will click on run design. So again, uh, the software is going to generate a design result page. For today, I'm going to highlight the most important portion of the design result, which is the design ratio table. Um, if you recall in Norris head calculation, uh, the design was checked for bending, for axial compression, as well as for combined nodding. Uh, in the software, we does a few additional design check. This includes the shear design uh, for the CLT panel under wind node. Uh, we also look at the uh, deflection of the wall panel. Uh, in the example, um, the governing node case is uh, axial compression, uh, which is the same uh, in the software run uh, as well. Um, so below the design ratio table, you can see um, additional information such as the strength values being used for each criteria. Uh, the modification factors. I recall Laurie spent a lot of time uh, explaining the column stability factor CP for compression and for combined nodding. And this is uh, being displayed uh, in this section as well. Below that, you can see the critical uh, node combinations for each uh, criteria shear bending deflection, etc. So this is meant to give structural engineers transparency as to how the software calculates uh, its analysis value. One last thing I want to show today is the diagrams uh, generated by the software. So as you can see, it generates four diagrams, reaction, shear, bending, and deflection. In our example, uh, the, there is a uniform wind node being applied. So this, this is the reason why uh, the bending moment and the deflection is the highest in the middle of the span. Yeah, so Lori Masi, that's, that's all I want to show. That was great, thank you, Yang. Um, and in the new year, we do have some new uh, educational tools. So keep an eye out because we are going to be working with our, our colleagues at the Canadian Wood Council to uh, do some new and different types of learning uh, around their, their Woodworks program.
So with that, uh, we can open it up for some Q&A on the entire program on this, this example in particular, or anything on the software. Um, and I do see we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, let's see. All right, here's a good question for uh, Young and America. Uh, folks are curious, can the software be, is the software web-based or can it be used offline? I can take a stab at uh, uh, that question. So Great. Um, I think, yeah, the, the software, you can access, access it uh, either um, online or offline. So if you don't have, if I understand this question correctly, uh, if you don't have internet access, you can still uh, use it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, folks asking if they can have access to the MathCAD files. Uh, we are, do not share those. Uh, you are uh, free to copy the PDFs uh, that we presented today, but we do not share the uh, we do not share the MathCAD files directly now. Uh, let's see, questions on uh, stud spacing. That's a good question. So studs spaced further than 24 inches apart. Um, when you start spacing uh, studs further than 24 inches apart, you uh, kind of stop um, getting the, the benefit of the repetitive member factor, which we typically would apply with stud walls. So if you're, if you're trying to accommodate, you know, a, a picture window or, or something like that, um, you know, it might be, uh, it might behoove you to, to take a look as designing a header over the opening rather than trying to push your studs farther than 24 inches on center apart. And a few resources while we're having our, our questions roll in. All right, I will just show you folks on our website here. So if you would like a link to the Woodworks software, let me see. Uh, if you go on our website, uh, which is awc.org, and I'm just waiting for it to pop up here for you all. I think you can see it. Um, so if you go to awc.org and you scroll to our quick links where it says calculators on the right side of the screen here, our calculators page our, and software page and scroll down and you will see a link for the Woodworks software for wood design uh, at the bottom here. So when we click on that link, then we have the Woodworks uh, software page pops up and this gives you information for uh, purchasing the, the Sizer program that we used today, uh, the Connections program that we saw used today, as well as the Shear Walls program, which they have. So we definitely encourage you all, if you enjoyed uh, the, the software demo today, go check out their website. You can contact CWC directly through their website with questions. There is a U.S. edition. As you can see, it conforms to the NDS, the IBC, ASC 7 and, and SpidWiz. And we are at about the half hour. Hi, Lori. On our, on our site that you're showing here on screen, um, uh, anyone can get access to a, a three-day trial. So that's, you know, for them to, you know, get used to the, to really explore what the software and capabilities that it has to do, you know, before committing to the full uh, loan version as well as the uh, yearly subscription fee. Excellent. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lori, America, and Young. This was fantastic. Lots of great information. We are delighted that you've been here today. Hope that you found some information and happy holidays. <laughs>